Okay. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Lee, one of the pastors here. Um, we've been in a series called the Spirit of Counsel. Um, I think tonight is our 15th entry. Um, and next week we'll be transitioning on to um, a separate section of this that, that uh, works in tandem with some of the things we're talking about tonight. Um, and, and I hesitate to give a broad overview right now because um, I want to stay right where we're at. And if you would allow me the freedom to bounce around a little bit, um, I want to address a few different things um, that have been spoken over, over the past few months with um, God working in our hearts. God breaking our hearts, God softening the hard places, God um, revealing areas where we're seeking our own way. Um, you know, whatever, whatever language you want to use to sum up the keeping up with the repentance in our lives, um, we're called to keep up with the, with bearing the fruit of repentance. Um, and meaning that <clears throat> we turn away from our way of seeing things and come into alignment with his way of seeing things and walk accordingly. That's all repentance is. Um, it's not the, I grew up thinking repentance was, it's when you feel really bad about your shortcomings and you feel really bad about who you are. And then you go sit in a corner until you feel better about yourself. And then you could come out and play again. Um, you know, if anybody grew up with that model, repentance was a timeout. It was a um, self-inflicted punishment. But biblical repentance simply means a shift in perspective, a turning of a mind. Um, when you break down the Greek words, it means something presented itself and your mind shifted, and now your mind is in a repented state. And because your mind is in a repented state, your actions follow. This is what it means to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And, and what we forsake, remember, I, I, I just feel like there's so much in the air right now. Um, a carnal mind is an enmity with God, according to Romans. So our minds have to be renewed. Our hearts have to be renewed. And, and the Jewish people saw hearts and minds as, I, I want to say, you know how we say gut feeling? You know, follow your gut. There's a gut feeling on things. There's a reason that some of these words are so interchangeable, and heart and mind is, is one of those things where they saw them as so intertwined that, yeah, you need a new heart, but you also need a new mind. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So this renewing of our mind, this repenting that happens comes down to three questions. Um, I think you could sum up the three areas of repentance in your life in three questions. Who is God? Who are you in him? And what do you do about it? Right? What is God's identity? What is my identity? And what do I do about it? Because those are the three areas that we, we can get the first two right and get missed and we can still apply the second part or the we can get the first two questions right and understand who God is and, and understand who we are in him, but still misapply or, uh, or answer incorrectly the third one. What do we do about it, right? And so these are the areas in which we find ourselves repenting from and, and renewing our mind in. Is as we grow in an understanding of who God is and his goodness, we grow in an understanding of who we are. And we come into alignment with that. And we start shifting things and responding differently. Because if God has called me good and I know he's good, then I need to come into agreement with that regardless of what I think of myself. And then I begin to walk in a way that reflects what I've actually come into agreement with. Is that, are you hearing me? That is what repentance is. And I love John's example the other day. Um, well, it was probably the other month because uh, it was a while back, but it, but it, of, of Abraham for what, 25 years, walking around introducing himself as the father of nations with no kids, no kids, 25 years, carrying that as a name and introducing himself as that. But he was in agreement with what God had spoken and he didn't have the right to step that to the side and do what he wanted to with it, amen? And it's the same with us. Our identities, everything flows from our identity in him, everything. And we're going to get into some of that tonight because I don't. Your calling and your giftings don't matter if you don't understand who you are. 
Because if you have your calling and you have your gifting, but you don't understand who you are, you're going to misapply everything anyway. And we've used these analogies before. I'm not going to rehash all that tonight. But your identity is your foundation. Well, God is your foundation, but who he says you are is pretty important. Amen? Your identity in him as a son and a daughter. And you have to understand, when, when picture, uh, the, the picture that I get is a diamond. And it, and it represents the fullness of God. And each one of us is a different facet of that diamond. So we're all sons and daughters. We're all pieces of this diamond. But each one of us will reflect God in a way that the other ones can't, nor should we. I shouldn't reflect God the way Melissa's meant to. That should remain her lane and her, her reflection. I shouldn't try to be a better Melissa. I shouldn't try and be a better Corey. I shouldn't try and be a better Scott, right? I should seek the one that has called me to be Lee and understand to my core what that means to be and then do that. And as I'm doing that, now let's start implementing these gifts and these callings. And I bring this up, not even to get into gifting and calling tonight, but to get into, I'm going to use the word priority. I think we misuse it. I think I misuse it, but, but I'm going to use it and maybe misuse it tonight. But I'm going to use the limited language we have to try and get some things put in front of us tonight. That your, your priorities in life, um, family, church, loved ones, jobs, hobbies, whatever those may be, I don't want to rank those one through ten because, frankly, your identity comes first and it should be reflected in those things to the degree that God has called it to. And so there are times in my life, because here's the thing, we often associate, if we number our, our and I'm staying away from using the board for a moment, but if we number our priorities the way that we're taught to, we often attach our yes to those things and our time to those things in the same order of importance. You hearing me? How many of you know, if you work a 10-hour a, a day, you don't have 10 hours afterwards to give to your loved one? Does that mean they're all of a sudden less important? Right. That's, that's a practical example of why that perspective on things doesn't work, is I can't number my wife first and then make sure down to the minute that I give her every uh, or more time throughout the day than I do whatever my number two is. And it's going to look different in different seasons. We've talked about this stuff, but I want to rehash some of this stuff tonight. Is, is my wife and my job and, and my calling here at the Ark and my calling outside of these walls at the Ark and the way that I connect with family and the way that I connect with friends and my hobbies, all of those are equally important because they should be flowing from my identity. And so I should enter into those things intentionally with an understanding of my the limitations of my yes to those things and where my no needs to be. Because ultimately, <clears throat> and I'm going to jump a little bit ahead tonight, um, can we pull up the, the Proverbs verse that I sent you? Four, I've, I've given you four interpretations of Proverbs 25, 28. A person without self-control is like a city with broken down walls. A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. Like a city whose walls are broken down is a man who does not control his temper. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Historically, walls that don't have, or excuse me, as, walls that don't have a city can be useless at times. But a city without walls is what? Susceptible to damage to plunder, to being uh, overtaken. They, they are in, in danger of danger at the end of the day. And what this is referring to and what we're going to talk about tonight, I'm going to use words like boundaries. I'm going to use words like uh, discipline. But ultimately, this is not from a perspective of control. This is not even uh, from a perspective of guarding your own life because we're called to lose our life. This is about guarding what God has called you to so that God can guide you in how to actually steward that thing. Because we can give our yes to God. We can agree with who God is. We can agree with who we are in him. And we can agree with what to do about it. But the will of God, I like to say, is, is, is still a, a, a triune perfection. Is It's not just what God wants to do. It's how God wants to do it. And it's in God's timing. 
And there's a lot of times that we get the what God wants to do correct, but we fail on either timing or the Im implementation or expression of how he wants to do it. Make sense? And this applies to even, even you. Like, let's say Frank, because you're in the front row, and I dig your hoodie. Frank, Frank could agree with God on who he is, and Frank could agree with God on what he's called to. But as humans, we have a tendency to say, oh, well, let me do it this way, because I know these things, and I've gained this perspective, and, and I'm excited about doing this, and I have this gift. So surely, it should be done this way. Again, I feel like I'm on repeat a little bit, but just, just have some patience with me. I'm, I'm getting somewhere with this. These boundaries or walls that are placed around your heart, because it says, um, I forgot the address and I don't think I sent it to you. Above all, above all else, guard your heart. Above all else, protect your heart. There's different ways to um, interpret that verse and there's different ways to break it down. But one of, one of the clearest ways I want to communicate this is it is not about, it's not only about making sure you're not taking things in. Because a lot of us, and, and this is good, right? We call it the eye gate, the ear gate, the, the, the whatever gate. You want to you wanna pay attention to what comes in because out of it flows this wellsprings of life. Amen? Out of it flow the wellsprings of life. So we should guard, but when you start breaking down some of the language and, and the imagery of what, what they're talking about in the Hebrew is, is that you're meant to diligently, daily take inventory of this thing and protect it. Not just against outside forces, but against internal enemies. AKA the hard spots a.k.a. the unrepentant spots, a.k.a. the bitterness, the unforgiveness, the anger, the, the whatever, whatever you're, the offense, the, 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 the depression that's taking over, the desire to go do this, the desire to go do that, the lust. Those things can get encapsulated in and never dealt with even if you stop paying attention to what's on the outside getting poured in. Merely cutting things off in your life doesn't lead to a breakthrough in a, in, in a healing here. It's not enough. This stuff has to be brought to the surface, examined, dealt with, taken out, right? We call that deliverance. This is deliverance. This is being delivered, but it's not all from outside forces. It's from what's already inside of you. And this is a process at times. Some stuff is a process. Some stuff's immediately. Take it up with him on why it's that way, man. I, I don't get it. We've been over that. It's frustrating. I don't get why picking on Frank. There, there's things that he just was delivered from, and there's things I'm over here just struggle busting in and yeah. buying a second ticket on a round trip that I ain't got no business being on. And it's frustrating. But there's a preparing, and we'll get into that here in a minute. This process is for a reason, guys. This process is for a reason. So my, my heart is, is taking this scripture and, and the, the, the scripture about guarding your heart, and it even talks about uh, prison walls being around your heart and these different things. It's not for the purpose of keeping your life. It's so that you can actually hand your life over and give it over in a way that honors and respects God, that honors the calling that's on it, because we're called to lose our life, our life for his sake, right? So we can't just protect and keep and hoard but it's a stewardship so that we can offer a worthy sacrifice. And, and hear me when I say that, because I feel like all, my, all we have to offer is filthy rags, right? But this is how we honor God and allow this thing to be, I want to say as worthy, but as honorable as it can be, is Lord, you've entrusted me with this, so I will steward it well. I will invest this, and I will give you that return right back to you, right? The parable of the talents and, and those different things. So it's through that lens that we're talking about this. This isn't to wall ourselves up into isolation, live in our hidey holes in my language and play video games and live out the rest of my life waiting for Jesus to return. This is about, okay, let me, let me do the diligent hard work on my end to make sure that I am in a position to be used by him day in and day out. That's what this is about. So now looking back at these priorities that we talk about, our wife and our kids and our husbands and our families and our parents and our friends and our hobbies and our jobs and our all those different things. It's on the heels of last week, I want to provide some more clarification into 
the biblical concept of connecting with people where they're at for the sake of calling them forward, but not remaining too much in the muck and mire to where you get sucked in yourself because bad company trumps good character. This is what it's reflecting on and, and talking about when we're talking about without self-discipline, it's really difficult to send somebody out into the battlefield. When you see somebody that's tossed to and fro like a wave, it's hard to set them as a foundation for other people to stand on, right? But yet this is what we're called to. We're in 2 Corinthians 3, 4, and 5. And, and can we pull up uh, verse 16 through 20 in 2 Corinthians chapter 5? From now on, therefore, we, re re blah, blah, blah. we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in, in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And we've covered this a few different times, but, but what I want to, so what I want to focus on tonight is, is reminding ourselves that we don't have the right to view people as we see them in the flesh. We have to see them in the spirit. We can't hold them. Um, at the same time, though, we can't hold them to a standard that they are not able to obtain to. So just because I know, for, for sake of argument, if I know that you're called to this, I can't expect you to walk in that immediately. And, and we would know that on paper, but simultaneously, we, when we hear that we've been called to something, want to begin to walk in it in the now. And that's a natural response. I'm not here to condemn that. I'm not here to shut that down. I am here to shut it down, the doing of it. Um, but, but the response in our heart, the leaping for joy, the seeing that what, what like, when you, when you begin to know who you are in him and what you're called to, that should be an exciting thing. And that should be met with enthusiasm, praise, joy, um, and, and encouragement. But with every anointing, there is a preparation before there is an appointing. And I've been listening to this a little bit this week, and it's, it's stuff that's been covered for years. But it, it bears rehashing. How long was David a shepherd before he became a king? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the, 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 the number of years. If somebody answered it, I was going to say, that's right. Um, but, but I don't know. <laughs> it's multi, yeah, multiple choice. I might be able to whittle that down. But he was anointed as king long before he ever stepped foot with a crown on his head and ruled as king. And that in-between time was the preparation. And, and I'm not here to strictly talk about David, but you see the same thing with Paul. Paul was anointed on the road to Damascus. It took him three days to come into to a place of, of walking out his yes, that's my language. But for 13 years, he was trained up. And that's somebody that knew the Bible in and out. The Bible up to that point, right? Knew the Old Testament in and out. Somebody that, that was, um, met Jesus face to face after Jesus had died and rose again and, and ascended. I mean, this, this is by all, man, if anybody, in my opinion, if anybody had right to start walking in what they were called to, Paul was one of them. 13 years he sat. And when I say he sat, he was trained up. There's, maybe he was, went here and went here, but, but he didn't walk in what we know him for walking in. Immediately, there was a time of a preparation. Because guess what? You have to unbecome the things you are in order to become everything that God has, has called you to. And that is what this transition place is. And here's the thing. It doesn't take, you don't have, oh man, I don't want to say this. We live in a culture that battles with entitlement. And we find it in culture because it's rampant in the church. Myself included, I'm in the church, it includes me. I'm, I'm not 
pointing the finger at everyone else as much as I would like to. But, but this thing and pull about entitlement is frustrating because the thing you feel entitled to is the thing that God wants to give you a lot of time. I'm not saying everything. But for, the, for this illustration we're using, David was anointed. You're going to be king. No ifs, ands, or buts. I'm sure he had doubts. I'm sure he had fears. I'm sure he had questions. But just forget all that for a, th- for a moment because there's some things some of you in here know about your life and are fighting for in your life. And that's the kind of knowing I'm talking about that can lead to entitlement is I know that God has said this. I know that God has spoken this. I know that this is what I'm holding on to. And, and, and the frustration of knowing that that is what God has given you can create and develop something in you that will actually stiff arm the processes that are trying to prepare you to walk in that thing. This is other language when we call it the desert. We call it the desert because, and we associate punishment with it. But there's another thing we need to associate it with, and it's the preparation for the promised land, right? It's the preparation. It's, it's the dealing with the heart positions. It's literally the deliverance. The deliverance happened, but it took 40 years for the deliverance to happen. There was the already and there was the not yet. There was the immediate and there was the process. And it's no different in our own life. And this is why you partner this together. I, I, I've said that there is no man, woman, or child that can hold you back from the things that God has called you to. They can't. And that should be freeing to know that nothing stands between you and where God has placed you except that path of preparation of dying to yourself and unbecoming everything you think you are so that he could prepare you and, 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 and build you up into everything that he needs you to be. This road of preparation. And in this process, I'm going to use the word triggered. I don't know if that's going to trigger anybody. Um, but I heard a, a definition of triggered a couple weeks ago. And I really like, because I'm triggered more than I care to admit. And I'm triggered more than I will admit. Um, but it doesn't have to, li- listen to this definition. When your response is disproportionate to reality. That was a convicting convicting definition for me. When your response is disproportionate to reality. When something happens for the sake of argument that's minimal, but your response turns this thing into a, you ever heard of making a mountain out of a molehill? That's what we're talking about essentially. Well, and, 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 and you've ministered to people like this. You've spoken with people, that, uh, and people have spoken to you. But all they said was this. Why is this your reaction? Well, they knew what they were doing when they did it, and this is what it meant, and this is the dominoes that are falling now, and da 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 and on goes the list, right? Okay, that's triggered. I'm not condemning your trigger. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not condoning it either, but what I'm trying to draw attention to is that when our response is disproportionate to the reality of what's going on, that's a sign that there's something in our heart that needs to be addressed. That's all I'm bringing attention to. Because a lot of times our response, or let me say it this way, our having a response is valid. Our having a response is because, it could be because we saw something that should be responded to. But what God is trying to work in our own hearts is being ministers of reconciliation that when our responses happen, they're from a place of peace, not from a place of emotion. That they're from a place of allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us into what to do about it, not us using human wisdom and and, and trying to extinguish fear or whatever, whatever's flying out of us at the time. This makes sense? And, and, and when you began to, but wait, When you begin to recognize these triggers, you'll begin to be, 
I would suggest a lot of people begin to get overwhelmed with how much they're triggered. Um, a lot of people begin to get overwhelmed with all of the work that needs to be done in their heart. Um, and I, man, I, I hear that. I, I, I get it. Um, cause I feel like every time that, that I've had breakthrough every time that God has revealed the more or the next step or, or what's coming, what comes along with it is, um, but this is going to have to shift. Uh, but this area that you thought you were done working on is actually going to need refined more. Um, this area that you thought was healed was, was, was bandaged on the battlefield, and now it's time to open it up and do surgery, right? And so I get all of that, but, but I'm trying to debate how long to stay here because some of these things, once you bring them up, you got you to gotta go to the end. Um, but a few months ago, one of the things that, that I said um, and that we said that God was highlighting is control. That one of the areas he's refining in people is control. And, and I want to read this to you because um, this is what God has placed on my heart for a reason and we'll get there um, as the night goes on. But when you rely on control to have peace, you will always be triggered by situations where you lack control. Now remember, triggered means a disproportionate response to reality. So if you rely on control to have peace, when you're in a situation where you're lacking control, you will be triggered. Because your peace is resting on something that is not foundational. It's, 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 it's not reliable. Because the reality is we, we control almost nothing in life, right? And where God has been moving us and calling us and building us up into as mature Christians is one that allows him to have control, not us. And the more we fight to have control, the more we're actually fighting what God is doing. Are you hearing me? And this stems from hard spots in our heart. It stems from not having walls. It stems from ignorance. It stems from naivety. It stems from rebellion. It stems from stubbornness. There's, I'm not, there's many different things that can come from. And I'm not going to address all that tonight. What I want to address is what are we going to do about it? Are we going to continue to fight for control or are we going to lose our life, right? So I need to make some of these things clear before we get into these quote-unquote boundaries and this guarding and this, this setting some things in place is because if, if we fight to have control and we try and implement boundaries when our heart is still not good and our concept is, oh, this will help me get to that thing that God is calling me to, we're actually positioning ourselves to be worse off than when we started. Are you hearing me? Because the sense of entitlement that I was talking about and why it's, it's difficult is there's a lot of things that God is calling us to. But let me sum up what we feel entitled about. It's not having to walk through that stuff to get there. God's called me king. Why am I not seated on the throne yet? God has called me as an apostle to the Gentiles. Why am I not do why do I gotta walk around for 13 years and listen to these guys? God has called me to do whatever in the city, do whatever in my family, do whatever amongst my friends, do whatever in the church. God's called me to that. And 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 I just said, and, and I'll say it again, nobody will get between you and that thing. And that's the realization we've been talking about these past few Wednesdays, I think Wednesdays, maybe Sundays. What's tonight? Tonight's Wednesday, right? Is is some of the way we're our <laughs> thank you, some of the way we're our own worst enemy in some of this stuff. Some of the ways that we're our biggest problem. Can I just say it that way? That that we're our biggest headache. It's not the people. It's that what's that? Uh, that I always I laugh when I hear that song. But it's hi, it's me. I'm the problem. It's me. It's a catchy song, no, but <laughs> is it? Is that she? Okay, that is okay. Thank you. It is Taylor Swift. Okay. No, what I was trying to avoid saying is that I watched 30 second videos on streaming. That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> I know the song, but not who sings it because, yeah, because I was already swiping. But anyway, um, yeah, 
Yes. Can be from entitlement. Can be from entitlement. Um, because when, and I want to I want to tell you how I see entitlement and how I'm using it. It's it's that's owed to me. And God has said it, so it should be here. And I, I and it gets weird because we talk about like I've said, like this declaring and decreeing, and and we're walking in authority and we're saying things, but our authority is represented of the one that we're representing. Like, like Paul said in verse 20, we're ambassadors. We're, we're, his message is written on our hearts. It ain't, it ain't our message. We're the bride representing a husband. So anything that we're called to do ain't even about us anyway. And God has given us these gifts, right? They're gifts. They were given. We didn't earn them. We didn't receive them. So how do we have the right then to say, well, I deserve this or I earn this or, or I shouldn't have to go through that? Because because that's the one that gets me. That's the one that gets me. I shouldn't have to walk through this. I shouldn't. Do you not, like, I shouldn't have to go through this. But it's it's the, the reality is, this isn't my earth. This isn't my kingdom. I, I'm... I was born into this, right? I mean, that, that's how I see it. I did, I didn't, I'm not even responsible for my own life. And in this path that's before me, <clears throat> you know, I keep going back to James where he says, consider it pure joy, my brethren, when you face trials of many kinds, is the mentality that I believe we need to have is that when trials come, instead of trying to stiff arm them, we actually embrace them because our perspective has been, man, um, I think, okay, I don't know if I've even answered your question, but the picture that I get that's locked in for me, and I'm, and I'm not doing theological stuff here. I'm just telling you what I read in the Bible, how God spoke to me prophetically, and how I see it, locked it in for myself and move forward. John in the wilderness, living in sackcloth, eating locusts, dipping them in honey. And I think I've shared this before. Maybe I don't share it enough. I don't know. But the perspective that I got, I remember specifically, I was mowing the lawn. I wasn't even thinking about that. And then all of a sudden, I just got this picture, and I was like, that's it. I needed that. John the Baptist living in sackcloth. Sackcloth often represents mourning or repentance. Mourning is when they put the ashes on. I can't remember which is which. Just forgive me and let me roll with this for a moment. I think he was wearing camel hair. Camel hair is what they used when they didn't have sackcloth. So I understand. I say he's wearing sackcloth. He's actually wearing camel hair. But camel hair was used in replacement of sackcloth if they didn't have that when, when Israel would mourn or repent. When they would mourn, I think that's when, they, do you know, John, when they used ashes when they didn't? Mourning versus repentance all the time? Okay. Because I read specifically there was times where they didn't use, mourn, or didn't use ashes and it meant something specific. But regardless, he's in the desert mourning and repenting. Mourning what God would have that isn't and repenting from the things that... that that need to shift in his own mind, which goes back to the beginning of the message, right? Locusts are what's sent to destroy things that have been produced. And honey often symbolizes the word of God, the goodness of God, the sweetness of God, and God's presence, along with wisdom, strength, and all these different other things. But I saw myself in John needing to be in a place of mourning what isn't, crying out on behalf of what needs to be, repenting in my own heart for my part in that, taking what the enemy has sent to destroy me, coding it in the God for sustenance and moving forward accordingly. And that's that's the perspective that I move through life with when trials come is, okay, this is locusts, and this is going to be used for God's good. What the devil intended for evil, God is going to use for good. And the entitlement part comes in for me, when I think I've mourned enough, when I think I've repented enough, when I think that I've gone through enough trials, Lord, can't I just be king yet? Lord, can't I start teaching yet? Lord, what about this? What about that? Isn't my heart good enough yet? And, and that's, to me, that's the best case entitlement or, or like the best case scenario of entitlement is like, man, I'm doing all the right things, but I still find myself in a place of entitlement versus the, I always think of teenagers. Um, teenagers desiring the things that are beyond their maturity level quicker than they're ready for. And we get that too. Right, does that answer? 
Okay, amen. So what I wanted to get into was knowing, and we've talked about this, this minister of reconciliation is being a, a, an example of one who has been reconciled to God so that we can reconcile others to God. Knowing that they're walking through the same things that we're walking through or that we have walked through in the past. And what I brought up, I was going to say last week, but I think it was two weeks ago, was three words. I think it was three words. Three levels, three layers of, of people that we interact with. And I, and I brought it up because I believe that... Um, let me give my, my uh, disclaimer first. In a perfect world, we would be sons and daughters and everything would flow from us and everything would be amazing and we wouldn't have to have any of these discussions, right? Um, and, and Christ's embracing of his identity and his sonship is what led him down the path that was prepared for him. If he had saw himself differently than, God, than who God created him to be, if he had decided to take up his own agenda, he would not have actually followed that path to the cross, right? He would have gone and done his own thing, but, but every step he took, everything that he spoke was flowing from a place of understanding his identity perfectly, having his life laid down perfectly, and, and, and representing his father perfectly. And, and I mean, that's, that's the end goal, that's the end game. But the reality is even he had different titles. Even he had different names attributed to him because we are limited in our understanding of the infinite. We're limited in our understanding of the eternal. And so we have different phrases that talk about different facets of his character. He was a shepherd, right? That's, that's a facet. And so, because I was having a conversation um, about being sick and tired of all the different hats that I wear. And, and other people feeling the same. I've got to put this hat on for this. I've got to put this hat on for this. I've got to put this. Can I just wear my crown and be who I am, right? But the reality is I'm limited. And I, and I would strongly, I will argue um, that we're all limited in our understanding of what hat to wear when. Because as we're being refined, it's messy. We were just talking about this tonight. It's messy when you're shepherding friends. It's messy when, when, you're, when, you're, when you used to be like, and I think of the, the, the clearest example I got, and it got under my skin to no end, was when I was in Teen Challenge, and a student all of a sudden became head of the house. I, I cringe even thinking about it, because I, re, I remember how my heart was. Um, was, man, we were, we were just out back yesterday doing this. And now today you're holding me to a standard that you yourself can't live up to. And I already know that you're doing it so you'll look good to your, to, to your boss. I can't roll with that. That's fine, Lee. Here's 30 days. <laughs> okay. And, and that's what it got me. It was my, my disobedience and my, man, I ain't doing that for you just because you're on a power trip stuff. That led to consequences. Who was in the right? Frankly, I think we were both wrong, but there was one of us that was more in the wrong than the other because I was not honoring a position somebody was walking in, a biblical position that God had put them there. Regardless of, of my justification for why I wouldn't honor them, because I was right, but I wasn't entitled to not treat them a certain way. And that's where I was getting hung up was my, I wouldn't have called it entitlement, but that's essentially what I was doing is I don't have to honor you this way because of X, Y, and Z. And so I thought that I was higher than the laws of God. And so I understand, like, that's an, to me, that's an extreme example of how you struggle to connect with somebody one day, and then the next day it's different. Um, and then the next day you're off duty, so you're back to being a student. Okay. But everything's for a purpose. And, and so what I wanted to get into tonight and what I've talked about in the past or, or, or the other week was, um, I'm going to draw this out. For reference points, because I am visual. Um, I'm going to draw two different things. We had... 
I know, and I know not everybody can see this, but I, I need it for my own sense of, of visualization for a moment. So we, we talked about last two weeks ago of sure that was that one of of the operative powers of the of of the spirit realm right there's there's oh, I should have done them different there's love on God's side and there's fear on the devil's side and there is only God and the devil there's not a hundred thousand other kingdoms there's the devil's kingdom and if you're worshiping Buddha you're you're worshiping the devil love you enough to tell you that but but that's how that works okay. Um, so there's God's kingdom and there's, there's the devil's kingdom there and everything is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. And that's the spiritual battle we're in. We've covered that to an extent, but fear is on this side. Love is on this side. Bible tells us when we walk by the spirit, we won't gratify the flesh and the desires of the flesh. You are spirit and flesh right now. Not anybody in here is hundred percent spirit. I, there's moments where you walk in it to, to the best that you can, and there's moments where your flesh cries out to live and you, and you go back and forth. But this is the spirit side. The spirit walks by flesh. It's governed, excuse me. The flesh walks by fear. It's governed by fear. Your spirit is governed by love. And most people are doing their best to walk in this place. When we're talking about in the church, most people are doing their best to walk by the Spirit, walk in love, walk in honoring God, walk in obedience to God. And, and they slip into walking by fear. They slip into allowing their flesh to, to rise up, right? That's what most people are doing. What, what 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 4, and 5 is calling, uh, calling us to, the, uh, among many things, the ministry of reconciliation. Reconciling people from where they're at to the cross, dying so that they can live and walk this way, right? This is the path that I'm talking about. This is the path of preparation. This is the path of unbecoming everything that you are, that you're not supposed to be, so that you can become everything that God has intended you to be, right? And so the anointing can happen over here. The calling out, let's use that phrase. The calling out and the speaking over, because you were born wired to fulfill this. You were born, your, your, your destiny, your dream, it didn't just come out of nowhere. The things that God placed in your heart were there when you were born. So what we're doing in reconciliation is actually calling people not to us, but to the cross that's going to crucify them, ultimately. We wouldn't word it that way, but for tonight, that's one of the things that we're going to talk about. Because what we're saying is, when I am, when I am here beckoning you this way, this is the way through and we will fight to find any other way to get over here right like it, it, any of us all of us everything that's in your flesh wants to live and it will kill you trying to do it write that down but you will try and find any other way around this our job is to keep the cross in front of our face when we're looking at people to view them through the cross and see them as already on the other side of this thing. Does that make sense? To, to see people as God would have them in their redeemed state, regardless of the, if they've even professed knowing God. But that doesn't mean that we're called to link arms with them and walk with them. It doesn't mean that we're called to, to, to share a house with them. It doesn't mean that they're called to be our roommate. It doesn't mean that they're called to be our best friend. It doesn't mean that we're even called to have them as friends. Because I can walk out of here and, and, and see going to, man, I, going to a bar, and, and, and I'm thinking of a couple of people in specific. Man, you're clearly a prophet of the Lord, but you are steeped in witchcraft, fulfilling what, is, what God has put on your heart by other spiritual means. You're full of rebellion. You're full of hate and bitterness. And, 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 and man, ultimately, you are a hurting child that needs to be restored to their father. And my heart goes out to you, but there's nothing I can do for you without you walking through the cross first. It, I, can, I can fulfill needs. I can slap bandages on things, 
but the healing you need only comes through the cross, right? So I want to make clear our heart's position before we start talking about some of these things. Because the other picture I want to draw that we use often is the old temple. You have, you have outside the temple, but within the temple, you have the outer courts, the inner courts, and the Holy of Holies. And this is the clearest example I could give to us when we're talking about priorities. And, and like I mentioned either uh, earlier, you have a identity in Christ, and that determines your priorities. Your calling, your gifting, and what God has called you to will determine your priorities in every season because we're called to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. We're called to honor what has been uh, imparted to us. We're called to honor the calling on our lives, right? So I don't ever go through a season where I push that all to the side and say, yeah, but for these next three months, I'm only going to do this. It would be wild to claim to know intimacy with God yet never speak to him, right? And that's what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm not saying there won't be a time to push pause on, on name a specific. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we never set down our calling to go pursue our own thing. That, that, would, be, that would be the rule. If there's exceptions, I'm, I'm willing to hear it. But, but your identity is who you are. And if your gifts and, 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 and anointing, or if your gifts and calling are flowing from who you are, you don't set aside your identity but it can look different for months or years even when God is dealing with these different spots in your heart. For instance, there's a position I'm walking in right now that I would be ill-equipped for had I not had a, a pastoral heart set in me over a period of years because the truth that God wanted to reveal to me if that was not partnered with the heart of God, I would not be speaking truth and love. I would just be a clanging cymbal and a banging gong. And there would not be a heart of a shepherd partnered with that. Does that make sense? That's, that's an example. But there was a time where this was set to the side to focus on this, right? So that's what I mean by these priorities was, okay, this is what God is working on. So from here, what does that look like with my wife? What does that look like with my church? What does that look like with my job? What does that look like with my hobbies? And then knowing that when another season shifts, okay, I've got to look at that again, right? So these concepts, <clears throat> I want to make sure I covered what I was going to cover there. Yes. Well, I think so. I reserve the right to come back. So during these times and concepts, what we began to see is, is that um, from our priorities shifting, our levels of intimacy with people will shift too. And that's the part that I feel like as humans, we, we get, we have the most fumbling with. Going back to these hats that we wear. Is this doesn't signify importance of relationships, um, but how we connect with each other. And let me, let me cut to the chase and give you some examples of what I'm talking about um, before we get into these three levels. Or actually, no, I'm gonna just going to stay the course. Picture this as the church for a moment. And like I said, anybody in the church, by default, what we're believing is that they try and walk by the Spirit to walk in the love of God and further the kingdom of God. And that they have momentary lapses. And momentary, what I mean is not permanent, right? Lapses where fear takes over and they're walking by the flesh. People outside of these walls are what we're going to label as demonic. That's what I said last week. They're demonic. They're, they're, they're um, what was the other word? Evil. Ultimately, they're dangerous. We are called to have no relationship with them, but an evangelical in nature relationship. And what I mean by no relationship, because look, we work, right? A lot of us work. We're not exempt from going to the office and dealing with people that want nothing to do with church. I understand that. Um, but what we were talking about is in light of guarding our heart that we are not opening up this thing and pouring this thing out with people in a way that, the same way that we would with people that are in the walls of the church. Are you hearing me? And, and I'm trying to stay, for, for, for time's sake, I'm trying to stay. You can read more about that in, I think it's 1 Corinthians, the first, I can't remember how many chapters. But we've, and again, we've talked about this. I just know there's new faces tonight, so I'm trying to cover some of the ground that I feel is lacking. 
but I got to keep moving. Go back and listen to last week, two weeks ago, whatever it was. But I can't, I can't be over here trying to pursue this and believe that my time, a majority of my time being spent with people like this is going to be beneficial to me. And at the end of the day, if we're talking about ministry of reconciliation, what we see repeated through the Bible is people becoming saved themselves in order to help other people, right? And so this is where we're talking about with Proverbs, bad company trumps good character is point blank. It takes somebody that has been in this environment for a very long time to spend a lot of time in this environment, okay? So, and time doesn't equal maturity, but it takes maturity and time in this place to begin to walk in this place for lengths of time. And it's evangelical in nature. That has to, that's, uh, that's what I need to stick in your head is it's not for the sake of, enjoying yourself. It's not for the sake of letting your hair down. It's not for the sake of, I just need a break. It's for the sake of bringing the lost into the kingdom. It has to be intentional. It has to be focused. And it has to be led by the Lord. That's my belief. Okay. <clears throat> now let's focus on in here. In here, in the church, you're going to have people that live by the flesh and live by the spirit. You're going to have newbies. You're going to have recent converts. And by recent converts, what I mean by that is even the people that are delivered immediately from some things are still struggling to learn how to walk in that. And it's deceptive when we live by eyesight because I know people that are 60 years old that are still fumbling around like a toddler, you know what I mean? And, and people that have, I'm not talking about anybody in this room. <laughs> I, I, okay, so I take it back, I was actually talking about Lynn, but <laughs> no. But, but you, understand, you understand what I'm talking, though, is, is in, and here's the thing. I want to make this clear, too. Maturity is not an all-encompassing term, even though I'm using it like one. Is if, I don't know, I, I like video games. I like when they break things down in percentages when you're trying to build your character up. But let's say you have 10 categories in, in the church. You could, be sure, you could be mature in nine of them. But what I'm talking about is that 10th one right now. You hear me? Because when I say God wants to take you on to something and he needs these spots in your heart to shift, you may be batting nine out of 10, man. I, I don't know. But I can tell you that what God is saying is you've come as far as you can with the heart position you've had. And that's awesome. But it's time to go further. And we ain't going further until that area is mature. That's the stuff I'm talking about, okay? So when we, when we see people in these these outer courts, man, they're learning, they're fumbling around. And, and we need to recognize that, again, these are not, um, and, and I'm just going to use the best language I can, they're not our peers in that sense. I'm not talking about importance. I'm, talk, I'm not talking about significance, significance in the kingdom. What I'm talking about is maturity level, okay? Because this is the area that we tend to get off in. But this is why, bringing up Tina's Ecclesiastes 4, why we need each other, is there's areas... You're not maturing, but I am, and vice versa. I already said that. There's things you've been delivered from. I wish I could talk to people with the grace that you had. That you could just go up to, the way you connect with people, the gift, man. And, and not many people walk with the confidence you can to connect with people like that and not get all flustered. Because what... Because honestly, most of the time, my gears are going trying to figure out what's going on and what's the agenda and how do I get there? What's the goal and how do I accomplish it? How do I beat this game right now? And, and what does that do? It causes me to just spin my wheels when there's a ministry and opportunity and I miss it. So there's a grace you have. And so anyway, you understand what I'm saying? There's a maturity you have in this area that I can't, I can't. I would be foolish to believe that I, now I may have some pointers in that area. But I would be foolish to come in there and say, Frank, man, I really need to school you in this area because, no, man, Frank, school me in that area. Train me up in that area, right? But then these other areas where, where I may be a little more proficient and let me, let me train you up, right? So I don't want to use this term peer as, again, like this levels of maturity. I don't want to use it as a all-encompassing term. And this is why it can get difficult. And what I'm telling you, you need to navigate by way of the Holy Spirit, ultimately. But let me tell you some of the 
pitfalls of why we're talking about this, okay? So I'm going to jump a little bit forward. When you hang with evil people, their company corrupts your character. When you hang with, oh, that's the word I was looking for. My apologies. My notes are a little bit out of order. I was looking for the word fools. Um, there's the demonic and then there's fools. Um, and, and for that, we could use the term ignorant. We could use the term, that they're not knowledgeable in the things of God. So a lot of their behavior is foolish. To, to somebody especially that's been mature, right? And so what, as a mature person, you cannot view a foolish person as a peer and treat them as such. You have to recognize the responsibility that you have because we are all called to be ministers of the gospel, ministers of reconciliation. We are all called to be trained up and train others up simultaneously. And so that's some of the stuff I'm trying to get into is how do we balance out our peership with our raising up, with our being raised up, right? And so these, these, these foolish people are looking to become wise. You would hope, again, if they're in this house, they're looking to become wise. So it's our responsibility to help bring them into this place of wisdom, into this place of maturity. So when you hang with fools as peers, though, you will not grow. You will not grow. If, if there's a foolish person, and this is, this is what I was probably the most guilty of, during some times in my life that I, that, I, that I could think of, is the reason that you won't grow is you're not challenged. The reason that you won't grow is that they don't have the capacity, the capability, or the calling in that moment in their life to train and equip you into the things that you're called to. So it's really easy to become peers with fools and kick your feet up and enjoy the ride. The problem is you will not grow. And so one of the reasons we bring this up is if you want to grow, you cannot look to peers to train you in this aspect. And that's what makes it difficult, is we actually have to start reaching out to people that have knowledge of the road you're trying to go down. You have to look to people that, that have been there, done that, and have wisdom to offer. Not as an overseer, taskmaster, harsh, tell me what to do and I'll do it, but as somebody that can help put tools in your hand and perspective in your eyes so you can walk that road. Does this make sense? Because the temptation is, especially when you go back to the feelings of entitlement and the feelings like I shouldn't have to go through this, is to look around and find other people that are like-minded and start creating a huddle. And now you have a whole bunch of people that don't grow and they keep running around in the wilderness, forsaking the path forward to become all that God has called them to be. And we've talked a little bit about that's, that's where false doctrine starts coming out because you have to create, you have to, at some point, if you're going to stay in this position, doctrine of God has to come out to justify why you're not going where God is calling you to. Doctrine has to come out to justify why you're not going to work on heart positions. Doctrine has to come out to, to start allowing you to stay in this place of tomfoolery. So when you hang with fools as peers, you do not grow. However, when you are a peer to a peer, you're learning together. When you're a peer to a peer, when you recognize, man, I'm not there, but neither are you, and we could be okay with that, let's find somebody that can help guide us, we can be peers in that aspect, right? And we can learn together, but if one of us starts trying to do this, we're gonna start butting heads, and things are gonna go sideways. Because when you try and father peers, you're out of your lane. Or mother. I'm going to use the masculine because that's the way it's written down. It's just the way I think. But when you try and father a peer, you're out of your lane. And I understand that iron sharpens iron. But a lot of times when we're trying to father our peers, what we're working from is human wisdom. We could be working from revelation from God, but it's not revelation that we've allowed to go to work in our own lives so that we could walk in a mature way to help people. And I believe this is where, where people can get off too because we overcome by what? The blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. The blood of the lamb is the works that Christ has done. And he is, he was made flesh, right? So and basically this is what I'm trying to say. You can be right all day and still not have let that go to work in your own heart. So you're not wrong in what you're saying. That is the way forward. 
It'd be like if I went to somebody that understood how to make a million dollars but was broke as a joke. That's what I'm talking about. I, you, and you know what I'm talking. Unsolicited advice from people that fail to live up to their own advice. That's those examples. Are you hearing me? People that, that, that never made it out of high school football trying to tell you how you're going to make it to the pros if you would just listen to them at the collegiate level. Are, are we connected? Are you hearing me? Okay, then I can move on. So when you try and father a peer, you're out of your lane. But when you try and be a son to a peer, you're not going to be raised up. You will not be raised up when you try and be a son to a peer. You'll always be limited to the perspectives of your peers. And you'll be fumbling and things will be taking slowly. This is, this is why this is important to begin to understand some of this stuff, okay? When you try to be a peer to a father, you are limited in receiving what is needed. When someone who has that maturity is, and has that perspective and, and understands this is the area of breakthrough that's needed to happen in your heart, but you view them as a peer or you view them as, as somebody that you need to pour into, you're limited in receiving. Because how many of you know when it says that, that you receive a prophet, when you receive a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. When you receive a righteous man, you receive a righteous man's reward. If you do not receive the one that has come, what they have to offer will not be received either. If you don't understand where this person is coming from, does that make sense? So when you try to be a son to a peer, you're not going to be raised. When you try to be a peer to your father, you're limited in receiving what is needed. But when you are a son to a father, you have full access to everything that's available. You have full access to everything that's available. And in, in the picture that I got was, especially with this father-son thing, is, is that Christ lived fully submitted to his father. And so there was, there was the flow of everything. But in, in I think this, this ties into when you drew the, the wells years ago. <laughs> yeah, years ago with, um, and I didn't realize that until I drew it just now. So for, forgive my side tangent. That's just a note. But when, when you're a son that doesn't understand how you're meant to be fathered and you keep trying to seek your own way, you're limited in this overlap of what's trying to be poured into you. Is that, visually, does that make sense? I, I, I wanted to let, I, I wish I had some slides for this, but I need us to get there so that we can begin to understand. That helps us understand how to connect with the people inside the church in a healthy way, keeping us honor, or excuse me, keeping us honest and accountable to where we are at and where our heart conditions are, beginning to recognize some of the frustrations we have with the people that we're connecting with, why it's going that way, and actually maybe beginning to open our eyes to some of the responsibilities that we have. Because if there's people, I'm gonna stop right there. Because we're called to be all of these things. We're called to father, we're called to be a son. We're called to, to be a peer, or mother, daughter, and a peer. And so we're always juggling these relationships. This is why I bring up the hats or, or, or the understanding of who you're connecting with. Because if you misinterpret who you're connecting with in the moment, and you do not read the dynamics of the relationship, going back to receiving a righteous man and receiving a prophet, you'll be limited in what you could receive and offer in that friendship. Because there are people that are trying to connect with you right now that need raised up. And if, if we won't own and be humble in what God has called us to, to raise and disciple people, we'll actually be in a place of trying to be a friend to them, and we'll wonder why people keep leaving outside of our relationship. It's because they were looking for something more. At time, That's just an example. But at times we have people that leave our side because they're looking for more than just a friendship. Then there's times where people will leave our side because they were looking to tell us what to do all the time. We didn't receive it, right? Iron sharpens iron. Watched a, a video, maybe some of you guys have seen it, of, of an ax getting used repeatedly against wood. And it dulls the ax. And the allegory was if, if, if iron sharpens iron, but it never gets around other iron, it becomes dull and useless. That's the word that got me, was useless. It's like you can't even chop wood eventually. 
and, and that's what began this diving in for me of what I felt like God was trying to lay some of these principles out and why I started diving into some of this stuff. I want to get to this verse, and then I think I'll circle back to this part. Um, can we pull up Matthew? Matthew 7, 6, 7. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. I wanna, I wanna talk about this for a moment. I wanna tell you why I'm bringing this up. My heart, my heart is for everyone in here to be trained up in what God has called them to and to not be taken advantage of by other people. What I have noticed in my own life um, is that when you have a heart that's after the Lord, um, it becomes really easy, or it can become really easy to begin pouring out everything that the Lord is giving to you. And, and that's ultimately what we're going to circle back to, I believe, if we have time with this uh, uh, picture behind me of the temple and, and the different levels, is that everything that God has given you, first off, is not meant to be uh, dispensed, especially immediately. But there are some things in your life that are for you. And there's some things in your life that that you're meant to process through with the ones that are raising you up. There's some stuff in your life you're meant to process through with your peers that you're trying to learn together with. And there's some stuff in your life you're meant to use to raise people up with, okay? But you don't take the things that you're processing through with, with, with the ones that are raising you and begin dumping them on the ones that you're raising up. It just makes sense. Because I wanna tell you, this, this is a beautiful metaphor. Um, and, it, and it's got beautiful imagery. And three of those words specifically in there are literally have a metaphorical interpretation, dogs, pearls, and swine. But I want to give you a literal interpretation of what this can mean when you break it down word for word, especially in light of a city without walls and, and a person that lacks self-control. Because that word holy can also be translated as saint, meaning a person. It's not just something that's been set aside for the works of God, but it can be a person who has been set aside for the works of God, okay? So when you start seeing that and you, and you can see dogs can also mean impure and tainted minds. Dogs in reference to people that are evil slash demonic, that their mind is not repented to the Lord and walking in that manner. Pearls can mean wisdoms, metaphors, and things that you have paid a great price for. Think of uh, the metaphor that Christ uses when he says, for the kingdom of God is like a pearl that was found in a field, and the person buries the pearl or hides the pearl in that field and then sells all they own to purchase that field. Pearls cost you something. They're refined by a process. They're mature in nature. They've they, when I say they cost you something, I mean they're, they're things and perspectives that either God has given you because of what you have poured in, or the time that you have spent with him, you have received from him, or there are things in your life that have been refined through a process, okay? So when you, when you start breaking these words down, you can define this literally. Do not give yourself out to impure minds, and do not pour out wisdom and metaphors and that which you have paid a, a great price for, to the scoffers and scorners. They will insult and shut down what has been said, and they will turn around and break you. That's what this is a warning of, is stewarding the things that God has given you so you yourself won't find yourself beaten down and broken. Because that last word, when it says tear you in pieces, it's not talking about like this metaphor of, man, uh, what is those, those brothers that leave the house uh, naked and bloody when they try and, yes, the sons of Sceva. I laugh every time I hear it because the imagery of, and I probably shouldn't laugh, but I do, is, is the sons of Sceva went in to, to do demonic deliverance. And um, what, what would the demons say? Christ we know and Paul we know, but we don't know who you are. And the sons of Sceva got thrown out of this place naked and bloodied by, by the conflict that happened. And this is talking about similar things, breaking you. Not just metaphorically breaking you, but how many of you have felt defeated before? 
right? How many of you have invested in somebody or invested in something and not seen the quote unquote return on the reward? This is language, again, you could see that when you start understanding these concepts, you can begin to see this language throughout Scripture. 2 Timothy 2, 2 is another example of that. Pour into wise men that can also pour into other people. Don't just pour into everybody, right? This is beginning to differentiate and call people to a higher standard. Because point blank, some of the things I'm saying, if you want, we need to have this mindset stewarding what we are called to is I am obeying God and headed this direction. If you see yourself getting poured out from me to you, you need to head in that same direction because I'm not stopping. But this is the kingdom of God. I'm a walking letter and invitation into what God is doing. And if you feel entitled not to have to go through some of these hardships, I don't know what to tell you. The door is open and the invitation is there, but our connection may look different because this is always drawing people to move with this standard, with this invitation. That's why it has to be spirit-led. But this is about you and your life and what you're called to. And understanding that that People can hold you back if you let them. I said no one can stand before you and what God has for you except for you, but your decisions by allowing people to, to remain in your life when they're not called there can hold you back from things because of your ties, not because of what they're doing. They're not holding you back. It's your decision to stay there that's holding you back. Are you understanding? Because if, if you picture it, the, the picture that I get is stagnation. If they're staying here but God is calling you here, and you stay with them, that's what it means when they can't go. And this is the reality of the kingdom. We don't like to talk about this hard language. I understand all of that. It, it invokes fear, it invokes feelings. But Christ said, if you love your father, if you love your mother more than me, this kingdom's not fit for you. This is about me being your one and only love. This is a, and you're limited in how you can love others by how much you love me and I love you and you receive that love and you grow in that love and you become who you're called to be. So I, I, I know, <clears throat> I want to emphasize my heartbeat again is that everyone would move forward in what God is calling them to. But I want to draw some, some attention to where people may be in, in your way in some of these instances. If you're feeling a frustration, if you're sensing that things need to shift, but you don't understand why. I think of there's, there's people that pour themselves out left and right. Anybody sits in front of them, man, I'll pour my heart out to you. I'll give you all my time. And, and it quickly becomes like a, a water that floods out and becomes stagnant is you're running yourself ragged, you're exhausted, and you have nothing left in. Well, you're pouring yourself out with whatever's in front of you. Are you aware of these principles? Are you pouring yourself out where it's being received? Are you pouring yourself out where it's being rejected? Are you pouring yourself out where, where they're not stewarding these things. And listen, I'm not talking about planting seeds. Going back to even the demonic we plant seeds with, but it's intentional. This, this is not a, and I'm gonna use the words again, cutting people off, but it may be shifting how you're attached to them. It may be shifting how you guys connect. It may be shifting what shared, man, I've been through it even with my own wife of, this stuff is not healthy for me to share in my own household right now. Because of whatever God is doing in her, this is creating more harm than good. That's why it says, uh, and I brought it up last week, reject a, or excuse me, correct a scoffer and he'll hate you. But correct a brother and, 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 and he'll love you. I think that's the way it's worded. But it's, but it's essentially, you can keep doing more harm if you just sit here. And you could contribute to the bitterness and contribute to the brokenness and contribute to the wound and contribute by constantly reminding. Man, I remember when I was small. I'm going to throw my mom under the bus for a moment. Um, I remember when I, it's okay, I love you. But I remember when I was smoking, uh, like cigarettes all the time. That was probably the hardest thing for me to give up. But, but she didn't miss an opportunity to remind me of how bad it smelled. Didn't miss an opportunity to remind me of how bad it smelled. Every time I come in, it's horrible. <laughs> or whatever you said. And listen, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to keep this light, right? Like that's, and, and, and I, literally I forgot about that until just now. So I, it's the Lord, take it up with him. I'm kidding. But, um, but I just remember this thing in me, well, I'm going to go out and smoke another one. That, like, that was, I was a scoffer to the wisdom you had because you weren't wrong. Your heart was for me. You wanted me to stop. But the limitations in your own maturity with the Lord, whatever, 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 right? You're human. This is like 20 years ago. 
but was you were, you were trying to bring truth to my eyesight so that I could see and repent. I know your heart was good in that. But I was a scoffer in my own heart. I don't need to hear that truth. I don't want to hear that truth. And so it began to, to like solidify a wedge in my own heart. So was she wrong? I would argue no. She wasn't wrong in what she had to say. But biblically, I would say that what should have shifted was her not correcting the scoffer anymore. She should have saw my own rebellion and left it between me and the Lord, right? Like that's the language we use now. Um, and thank you for letting me use that as an example. Uh, <laughs> no, thanks for volunteering for that. Um, but it's, it's the clearest example of, because basically what I was trying to do is show where I was a scoffer. And, um, but you were wasting your efforts. You were wasting the energy that God had for you. But it was out of love for me is the point I'm trying to make, right? It was out of the goodness. It was out of, like, best case scenarios. Man, I just want to see my son saved. I just want to see my son get through this. I just want to see my son have victory. And we end up putting ourselves in a position where not only are we depleting our reserves, but we're actually reinforcing the thing that's between this person and God. We're sometimes lifting that protection or that veil or that buffer is the term that I, I think of. Is, is There are times where it's time to remove yourself as a buffer and leave that person to what they've requested. Because ultimately what I was requesting is stop reminding me of it. Yeah, but it could lead to your death. Stop reminding me of it. And I never, I didn't voice it, I don't think. Well, I, I probably said something. But, but, but ultimately, you're giving these scoffers over to their own devices. Uh, man, that's why these dogs and these swine, it's important. Again, we're not talking about seeds. There's ways to connect with people that are dogs and are swine. I don't even like using that language, honestly. But I'm saying people outside the kingdom, the demonic, the evil, whatever... Wherever they're at, there's ways to connect with them. And if we love them enough to draw these boundaries and guard our hearts and build our walls up so that we can be healthy, we would actually begin to be prepared for the things that God is calling us to as well. Because let me tell you, if you can't do this at this level, you will get eight up at this level. Eight up. And I'm, I'm preaching to myself right now. And I'm not even at this. I'm still down here. And it's overwhelming. Because these are things that I, I wish and prayed I would have learned as a five-year-old. I wish I had learned this at 10, at 15, at 20, at 25, at 30, at 35. Here I'm at 39, and I'm like, man, I think I finally get it. And the reality is, nah, I, I, I'm scratching the surface. I, I know I'm still off. But man, we, I, my, there's so much more that we can be used for when we represent the, the king well, when we represent our father well, when, we, when we're able to show what the love of God really looks like. And like I said on Sunday, love is not unconditional the way we preach it, the way we, we understand it. It's unconditional on this outpouring, but it is conditional upon a connection. And there's checks and balances and, and requirements when it comes to this stuff. My heart is always for you. Punch me in the face today, run away, call me names. Heart is still for you. I might got some things I got to work through, but my heart is always for you. That's love. And, and, and God is always, always pursuing us, always pursuing us with his love. Doesn't matter if we run a thousand miles, how far away is he? One step. It's that turnaround step. It's that repentance step. And that's what we want to model if we're talking about modeling God's love. Is those. I love you enough to pursue you, to see you be who God has called you to be, not who you think you need to be or who I think you need to be. And the boundaries create from that place. But we got to get it first. This is my identity. These are the things I'm called to. This is how I'll steward those things as priority. This is how I will invest the talents that God has given me. And that because of that, this is how I will connect with these things. And guess what? When you get it all figured out, roll it all up and throw it out the window because things shift again. And you'll find yourself in another position of frustration because we grow glory to glory and faith to faith. Amen? So we're not trying to make a legalistic algorithm equation, but I want to talk about kingdom concepts and principles 
and, and, and application of, of how you start walking out some of these kingdom principles in your own life for the purpose of you being all that God has created you to be, but also being an invitation that everyone around you could be who God has called them to be. Amen? Amen. Lord, thank you for the opportunity tonight to come together in your house, to, to talk about and discuss and, and, and look at the heartbeat of you and what you're doing right now. God, I pray that we continue to repent in our own lives of the way that we demand our own way, the way that we enforce our own way, and the way that we strive after our own way, and that we would submit to your process that we would believe we've been anointed and we would trust in you for the timing of the appointing, that we will be the Davids in the field feeding the sheep and taking care of what would from the outside seem beneath us if we were quote unquote really kings and queens, that we would not forsake the, the, the menial tasks or, or the, the daily grind tasks or the mundane tasks but we would find joy in them. That we wouldn't forsake the coming together and the gathering of the saints. God, I do believe that you're washing us right now as a body, that you're cleansing us. And I remember, I think it was two summers ago, we talked about what it looked like and, and biblically the, that the washing comes through prayer and consecration, but also the gathering together of the saints. And we can't just get washed one way. We've got to be washed both ways. Father, let us be refined by fire and by iron, sharpening iron. Let us raise up and also be willing to be rose up, raised up, risen up. Lord, thank you that we don't have to have all the words right, but our heart positions remain true. God, we position ourselves before you tonight. We surrender all to you, and we ask that you breathe life on us again, that we may glorify you and bring, bring uh, reverence to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. All right. Thanks, everybody. Mom.